The Conservatives, <laughs> on the other hand, I think have a, an incentive to call an early election, uh, partly because they think they might catch Labour on the hop, but secondly, it would put an end to the sort of endless... Tory Faragist soap opera mm. week in week out which I think is having a depressing effect uh, on their standing in the poll. Here we are again then how to win an election with me Matt Shirley. Uh, joined as ever we're all back together again Peter's back from his travels we've got new Labour mastermind Peter Manson, Policy McKenzie uh, is here, and Tory Brainbox Daniel Finkelstein. Nice to see you all. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, or if you want to send us a voice note, you can WhatsApp 0333 003 2353. Now, uh, where should we start? Let's start with the, just as we gather this morning, some breaking news. Rishi Sunak and his wife, Ekshanta Murti, have given an interview to Grazia magazine discussing their domestic arrangements. Let's just take a listen to some of the, the breaking news which is just coming into us. Rishi always lays out the structure and I fill in the structure. So he's like, they need to have a protein, a carbohydrate, a veg. There's not a single meal that I come home and they're eating those three things. No, they're not. <laughs> you also just don't like making them. I mean, it bugs me, so I actually sometimes come up back into the flat from the office to make the bed. I used to actually eat in my bed. Oh, God, that's <laughs> disgusting. Not anymore. And, but I am A for enthusiasm, so I see something... Yeah, but, but then it requires redoing after you've been very okay. enthusiastic. But I still well. I still load it, and then Rishi comes and rearranges it. It creates more work. It rearranges okay. it. <laughs> The, I wish there was some way of capturing your three faces as we listen to, <laughs> listen to that. So we've established that the Prime Minister uh, has given his wife a list of things that must be included in meals, which then aren't included in meals. Uh, he, She eats in bed and he sometimes... No, the Prime used Minister to Used to. to eat in bed. The Prime Minister sometimes leaves his number 10 office while he's running the country to go back upstairs <laughs> to make the bed because he's so annoyed at her inability to make the bed. And when she loads the dishwasher, he then unloads it and reloads it again. Please, no more. Well, <laughs> Spare you us. Say, you see, you say that, and obviously we all listen to that and think, gosh, I wonder whether they need to share that. Um, if they didn't, we would also have had about a year of people saying that the thing is we need to get to know them as people. Uh, because they used to say <laughs> no, that about no, Ian, no. They used to say that about Ian Duncan Smith. So people both do and don't. Everyone <laughs> always says, you know, the thing that we need to do is sort of have more open communication and uh, learn about them as people, otherwise we can't relate to them. And then when people do it, they say, I can't believe they've shared all this ridiculous information. <laughs> we didn't want to know any of it. So... You really can't. Uh, I couldn't really can't disagree win. more. I mean, I love this stuff. I remember when uh, <laughs> Theresa May and her husband were talking about that he took out the bins, uh, which they did on the was it the one on show? the one show? Yeah, boys' jobs and girls' jobs. And I, I don't know. For me, it does help me think of them as more human. They're kind of ridiculous, but then uh, so am I. So is my husband. We all have these kind of quirks, and of course, it's nothing to do with politics, really. And I, I, I guess. Maybe if, if Rishi Sunak is interrupting a Cobra meeting to go and make the bed, we might need to worry about uh, his prioritisation. But nevertheless, I, I love this stuff because it makes me feel less weird to be reminded that everyone's weird, Matt, including did, the Prime did, Minister. Matt, did, did, did Rishi explain whether they put pots in, in the uh, dishwasher? Because I'm, you know, obviously engaged in a domestic debate about that. Are you? Yes, and I need the Prime, I need the prime Minister's... In? Assistance. You, why not? What? You don't put saucepans no, in the dishwasher. No, I'm in favour. Oh, no, you do, oh, but your wife favor. doesn't. What's what happens Peter. in the Mandelson house, Peter? I want to know. Heavens alive. I want to know. I mean, he just, he, he who just, takes he, out the bins? He just throws the plates away. He's... <laughs> <laughs> Look. Um, Peter, this is Rishi this is, Sunak. Who takes out the bins? Rishi, I do. Rishi, Yay. well, in the countryside, I do. Um, <laughs> Rishi Sunak <laughs> is at minus 54%, yeah. according to a poll this morning. That is lower esteem and popularity than Liz Truss when she was Prime Minister. This is not going to work. It's sort of titillating, it's banal, it's something to sort of... That's why I love li it. ...listen to. Well, no one thinks <laughs> you know, so. No, you one, know, no the, one would... Danny, you, would have, you, you have made... The, you have made... Look, OK, <laughs> given your... Minus 54%. You might as well try Not everything. Danny. 
No, not you, Danny, the Prime Minister. You might as well try everything. OK, I'm not against it. I'm not against it. You might as well try every single soft focus mm. option uh, at your disposal. But this is not why the public do not warm to Rishi no, Sunak. No one thinks that it And is. the reason they don't warm to him is because they don't think he's a leader. And for the reasons that you've always said, uh, Danny, he didn't at the beginning make a decision to stand up for himself, define himself clearly, stand up to his party. And unless and until he does that and shows himself to be strong rather than weak, the public won't, yeah, but won't be But now he has at least to. on the issue of making the bed. Yes, so, OK, uh, he's taken a decision. But he's, he's, made also, his, he's made his position It's also clear. the hallmark of a politician in trouble because I remember the, uh, Nick Clegg hiring a dedicated press officer who's going to reach out to non-traditional media oh, and it was like not, no sorry gordon brown did Be serious it, for a second yeah. it is not it is not a criticism uh, a valid criticism in my view of any of these political uh whatever you want to call them stunts or yeah. interviews by any leader that it doesn't transform the position right of course it doesn't transform the position nothing does by itself by the way and this isn't going to do that it's as still danny, a, as danny still would a, say it doesn't make a difference yes it's still as well it's still it's still actually over actually i'm, I'm not quite sure that's true as a overall the overall you need to position yourself as a person and as a leader and that really does matter yeah. and of course these little small things are all a contribution to that so anybody who was looking at his PR profile would certainly say that one of the things that he has to come across to, to people as is human, um, and you would definitely do this. But the fact that, of course, you do one interview in Grazia and it doesn't change the situation doesn't mean it's not a good idea to yeah. do it. What exactly it's is Grazia? It's a very good magazine. Uh, which it's probably the most political of the fashion magazines. Mm. Okay, thank I you. I would say. Can you start an interview with them last year, I think? Yeah, well, I don't they, think he did this little video. They, they used to have a we, just, we still don't know who loads Keir Starmer's dishwasher. Oh, no. Yeah. But I think... We're not that, ready for an election probably, until we know that. But he I, probably doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something in what you say, Matt, about, um, you know, it sort of, oh, non-traditional media, which is kind of uh, arrogant and contemptuous, really, because most people are not caught up in this Westminster bubble. And the idea that a politician should think about engaging with people where they are, going to the magazines that they like to watch, the shows that they like to watch, and not thinking that it's somehow every citizen's obligation mm. to watch the 10 o'clock news, is it, you should hire a press officer for that yeah. stuff. And, and, it is and actually, Keir Starmer has... And I suppose the difference is, because he's behind in the polls, it's sort of funnier. Whereas Keir Starmer's <laughs> been doing a lot of this. He's been, you know, yeah. he's been on Talk Sport, he was doing... Um, Soccer Saturday, or, you know, quietly going, you know, he was on, what was it last week, Fantasy Football League? So, you know, but people, that's less of an issue because he's ahead in the polls, so it just looks like it's smart. Nick Clegg did Country yeah. File, Look, and that was to, very fun. It, 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 <laughs> this is something I'm slightly obsessed with because, um, and, and it is Ed Miliband's sandwich, uh, became a famous political uh, event. Um, there was literally nothing wrong with it, with the way that he ate it. He ate it like everyone else like, eats a sandwich. And um, the... Yeah. This was all narrative imposed on the fact that people thought he'd positioned himself wrongly, that he wasn't going to win the election, that he was a slightly odd yeah. person. Right. So we we so really David got Cameron at a hot dog with a knife and got, fork and still won. We've got to avoid, you know, and we've we've got to avoid imposing narratives of, that are just about the opinion polls on every event, and therefore assuming that if you're behind in the opinion polls. What you've done after being behind in the opinion polls is stupid or fatuous <laughs> or indicates you're, you know, you're d wasting your time or that you are under the illusion that if you interview, you're interviewed by Grazia magazine, you're going to recapture the polls, which I'm sure Rishi Zunek is not under that illusion. Which is a perfectly, it's, it's a small, perfectly reasonable thing to do for the reasons that Polly, you yeah. know, correctly explains. OK, let's move on to our other favourite game. Uh, not how does Keir Starmer load his dishwasher, but when will the election be? Uh, which was the conversation we had when we first uh, started this podcast. Is it 19 weeks ago? 20 weeks ago? Uh, so there's been new speculation about an early election. Here's Labour's Jonathan Ashworth on Times Radio this morning. And I think everything the Conservatives are doing in terms of both their uh, advertising on social media and, the, and the, their political positioning suggests to me that May is their preferred choice. So Labour trying to talk up a May election and then here's the Trade Minister, Greg Hans, talking to Stig Abel. Are you ready for a May election if it comes? Do you think there's any sniff of actually there being a general election in May? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
put, we'll, we'll, we'll put to one side the question of if Rishi Sunak had decided to call an election in May, would he have told Greg Hans? Uh, which is a separate point. But have any of you changed your minds about the election? We wouldn't have told Jonathan Ashworth. <laughs> I, I mean, the, <laughs> uh, so, um, no. I, look, I, I, you know, as you know, I've always thought that it was the right thing to do to hold an election in May, but it's become much, much less likely as we've moved closer because he's not Keir Starmer merely that he'd be taken by surprise, but himself at this point. No, I don't agree. I think that... I mean, the, the, the people who would be most disappointed if there was a May election would, of course, be the listeners of this podcast because mm. it would mean, you know, the end of the podcast, yeah. possibly, unless we get an extension uh, beyond. Well, we could um, change from how to win an election to how to load a dishwasher. The, run run. How to run a country, maybe? Yeah. The Conservatives, <laughs> on the other hand, I think have a, an incentive to call an early election, uh, partly because they think they might catch Labour on the hop, but secondly, it would put an end to the sort of endless Tory Farageist soap opera mm. week in, week out, which I think is having a depressing effect uh, on their standing in the polls and in, in, the, in the view of the public. Uh, I mean, it would preempt, you know, another six months of leadership contenders jockeying for position, designing and getting their websites ready to launch uh, uh, when the time uh, comes and diminishing and undermining the Prime Minister's authority. So I think, you know, as Danny has said before, you know, the argument for going early is because you might lose less badly uh, than if you wait. Do you think he's going to, though, Peter? I, I really don't know. I can see the case for it. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I don't know. I can't read the Prime Minister's mind. He's... I think the reason people are speculating now is because, well, there's about to be a budget, and, and the window in which he can call an election for May uh, to coincide with the locals is, what, about 10 more days? Um, and so everyone... Uh, who has uh, a kind of interest in having looked wise if he were to kind of press that red button is wanting to write their little column saying that it might happen. Uh, but the, the fundamental incentive that the Prime Minister faces is that he gets to be the Prime Minister until he calls an election when he probably has to stop being the Prime Minister, which means that unless the budget went so phenomenally well as to convert their 20-point deficit in the polls to something really radically different, I just... Like, why stop being the Prime Minister? Mm. It's fun. You get to do interviews in Grazia and people are interested in your dishwasher habits. That's not yeah. going to happen when you're not the PM. There was a... Um, so the part of the reason why this sort of drumbeat emerged again is it because the, the Rwanda bill is going through the House of Lords and then it'll go back to the House of Commons and then they hope to get it through uh, to get royal assent on March the 20th. And so that leaves a few days then Lift for them off, to get the yeah. first plane off and then he could call an election. However, the Times reports today that uh, they're unlikely to get flights off before April the 15th because the Kigali government will be holding its events to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. So we, we just hadn't factored that in <laughs> to our timetable. And clearly, number 10 hadn't. I do, I do think it's worthwhile factoring in the fact that they say they're not going to have one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that does... <laughs> but mean, they would say as, that, as, Theresa, no, as Theresa May said. Yes, yeah. and that and then I was about one. to come on to, but they <laughs> yeah. did. Um, so it's, it's, I'm just saying factor it in. Yeah. I, don't, I don't mean... Because... What I learned from that episode was that the political logic of a situation is stronger even than um, than what Rishi Sunak thinks he's going to do because Rishi Sunak may not know that he's about to call an election. Uh, in other words, the fact that he thinks he's not going to doesn't necessarily absolutely mean he's not going to. But if you look at the situation, including the point that Polly just made about where they are in the polls, you listen to what they've had to say uh, on it, you look at the state of preparations, you think about someone like Greg Hans who actually was Conservative Party chairman, so does has been involved in some of those discussions. And I listened to it, I just, I don't, you can't say because I absolutely thought Theresa May wasn't about to call an election and she did, but the circumstances there, the political mm -hmm. impulse there to hold an election was so strong, I just don't think it's but there Danny, now, so I don't think there'll be one. Danny, remember also the overriding judgment of the Conservatives' campaign manager, Isaac Levido. He has said, and I agree with him, that there is no chance of bringing Labour down in the polls and closing the gap until the campaign actually begins. So they think they've got a whole variety of different sort of strings to their bow and armaments and in the cupboard or whatever, and they're going to unleash these ones. And if you take that judgment, 
uh, and you think that you know Labour has certain sort of vulnerabilities. Also, your desire uh, basically is to reduce the amount by which Labour wins and possibly push them into a, a hung parliament rather than overall majority. You might just say, look, let's get the thing on the road, the campaign beginning, that's our chance to sort of level down uh, the, the, the Labour lead, gives us a chance to achieve a hung parliament, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, and the sooner we get uh, into this, the better. I mean, I can I can yeah, feel <coughs> that going on, it won't turning happen. over I in agree their with minds. You. I can feel it of going course. over in their minds. I don't. I, I. I. Okay. I agree with every bit until that last sentence. I can't <laughs> feel it going through their minds. So I. I think that the logic you're you're suggesting is quite compelling. There are there are political arguments for it. I've argued for it myself. Um, I just think we've reached the point where that isn't going to happen. Uh, that that's that's just that is an estimation not of what I think ought to happen, but I think what I think will. Perhaps I'm just reflecting the public's mood to get be put out of our misery yeah, but that's... <laughs> and to stop this being strung along for any longer. Well, that's going to go, go for January, Polly. I still think it's a possibility. So the the you know the November election, uh, which people to think is 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 higher on the likelihood is about the same time as the US election. You know, I think there's some sort of hope that because Rishi Sunak is ahead on that one indicator, which is who'd be the best prime minister to deal with a Trump administration, that maybe if there's a US presidential election and Trump wins, that maybe that will turn the British public back to thinking they need a Conservative prime minister. But, I mean, that's total speculation. Yeah. Um, well, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, it's budget week this week. Can Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak use it to shift the dial? Is it one of those things that matters, Polly? I think budgets, because they can come with big announcements that have real-world impact for people, sometimes very immediately, can shift the dial politically. Um, but the government at the moment is focused very much on the idea that tax cuts are the thing that will somehow kind of... Uh, push people over the edge back back to the Conservative Party. You know, Danny talks very compellingly about how important it is that people feel that the economy is working for them. They feel kind of cash in their in their pocket. And at the moment, with inflation still high, if if you could put tax cuts into people's hands, would they feel better? That that's the hypothesis. The problem is that even when you talk about I don't know a four hundred and fifty pound tax cut, that's a load of money from a government perspective, adds up to billions and billions of pounds and then it ends up being sort of like, you know, eight pounds a week or something in people's pockets it doesn't make that much difference and actually part of the problem is that where we are at the moment people people worry much more about the state of public services we've got councils really big councils, including birmingham for example facing these huge financial crises and and it just feels a bit like they might be out of step with where the country is uh, a staple of political commentary at the moment is, you know, I can't believe the Conservative Party thinks that. We've had a couple of examples, actually, in this programme. You know, uh, interviewing about his fridge freezer or uh, cutting taxes is going to win them the general election. I, they, they don't think that. Um, <laughs> nobody thinks that. It's just that they may think that both those things are good things to do. So um, they clearly do think uh, that reducing personal taxation um, will help them. Uh, I don't... I think it could be of help, uh, but only in so far as it is felt uh, by people, um, not as a political narrative, almost certainly. Um, at the moment, I, I think the government does have a problem, which is I don't, th I don't think it has a narrative. So it's trying to make this argument Britain's on the right track, don't turn back, but it's not explaining what the track is. Um, <laughs> so to what extent does this... Does this uh, money off taxation if they're proposing to do that contribute to being on the track if it if it does then it gives you a narrative and it can help in itself as a story if it does not then all it can do is as polly correctly says is make a small marginal difference to your income that's always positive uh, for a government uh, if, insofar as it does do that it will be helpful to them I, I don't so i think the impact will be pretty marginal um 
but I, you know, the only thing I would say is we should just guard against people sort of contentiously saying, I can't believe these guys have done this budget thinking it's going to transform their political situation. There's no evidence that anybody thinks is that. It, is it harder for them to sell this tax cut, given that for the last 12 months we've had Tories going around talking about how the tax burdens well, are the highest ever? So I, I, They've been well, telling us for ages that taxes yeah, are really look, high. I, I, I don't at the moment think that this tax cut, if it comes... We, uh, fits into a narrative about what they're doing, right? Um, and one of the reasons we've come back and back to this is because I don't think Rishi Sunak drew the line with, with mm. his trust correctly, uh, and therefore it's not obvious what contribution this is making as the economy steps along the road to the vision that Rishi Sunak has for the economy. It's just a tax cut. And I don't think, as such, it will contribute to the narrative. It might make a difference to, at the margin to people's sense of well-being. That is always helpful. But it's not... Um, it doesn't... It will not have a bigger effect, which is setting the narrative, anchoring the economy, then making Labour look like dangerous, risky change from that path. But I don't know what the path is. Just to try and answer your original question, Matt, uh, I think there are two budgets uh, from which some in politics... Uh, try to draw historical lessons. One is 1970 and the other is 1992. 1970, Roy Jenkins, on the eve of the general election, uh, uh, did, decided not, in his highly responsible and high-minded way, decided not to provide a giveaway budget to help Labour be re-elected uh, after its six years in power. And he's blamed by many uh, for giving victory to Ted Heath as well. This is complete nonsense. If anything, his sense of responsibility helped put Labour back into contention in that election. The reason why Labour lost was because over the four or five years before the 1970 election, we had gone from sort of devaluation in 1967 to the humiliating debacle over the failure to reform and bring the trade unions into some framework of law, uh, and, uh, and frankly to ignite the, the, the sort of the promises of growth that Harold Wilson had originally won election on. So that is the wrong conclusion to draw from that, that he didn't give a, uh, provide a giveaway budget and therefore he lost. There were deeper forces at work. In 1992, Norman Lamont is credited with securing victory for the Conservatives because he did provide mm. a giveaway budget. Uh, 2p in of uh, income tax in 1992 but I would contend the reason why the Conservatives were re-elected is not because Norman Lamont was sort of less responsible and less high-minded than Roy Jenkins it was because the Labour Party wasn't ready to win an election in 1992 we were not yet trusted we had not changed as a party sufficiently uh, from the 19, uh, uh, 1980s and that's why we lost. So be very aware, beware of over-reading uh, uh, lessons from, uh, from budgets. Uh, at the tail end of governments, you know, other forces are, are at work and you simply cannot change the weather, in my view, uh, by sort of tweaking tax rates and hoping for the best. And how much of this then, if, if we're saying that, it, that even the Tories don't think this is about turning around their poll ratings, if they accept that they are not going to win, and therefore, is this budget about tying the Labour Party up in knots, taking the spending, the non if it, you know, as reported, taking the non-DOM spending, which Rachel Reeves has promised yes. to spend on a whole load of things, if you take that and tie it up into a tax cut, what you're actually doing is just it's planting about, a bomb for after the election. It's about stripping the cupboard... Uh, yeah. bear and leaving the Labour Party with nothing uh, should it be elected after the election. But it's also about uh, pleasing your party grassroots. They, they That's what they think Conservatives are in office uh, to do. But also because Jeremy Hunt wants to avoid the blame uh, for not giving sufficient uh, away and helping the Tories' re-election chances. I, I think that kind of clever tricks of sabotaging the other party's policy positions is absolutely a consideration, both now and in the past. In the run-up to 2015, we on the Lib Dem side had been talking to the Conservatives for ages about a childcare offer, in particular to fill this slightly ridiculous gap that there was at the time between uh, the end of maternity leave and the start of any 
a childcare subsidy for anybody other than those on tax credits um, at, at the age of three. And we were really making progress. And then Ed Miliband launched a childcare offer for three-year-olds and George Osborne sort of turned on the head of a pin and decided that, in fact, what he wanted was to announce kind of a version of Ed Miliband's policy offer just to make life difficult for the Labour Party. And so good policy of bridging this gap which drives women out of the labour market um, was kind of completely sacrificed. And it is only now, in, what are we, 2024, that the government is finally moving to put in place the building blocks of a proper childcare policy that actually bridges that gap. And it, it, it's but so... unable to implement it. But unable to implement it. But it, it, it... And it is... It's such a sort of depressing reality of the way in which politics, though essential, and, uh, and you know, in the end, I am a Democrat, but my God, it's annoying <laughs> when great policy is undermined by the, these issues of kind of political sabotage. That, it happened in the run-up to 2010 as well, where... Uh, again, one of the most important problems the country faces around how do you fund social care across party consensus was being developed. And then it was on the Conservative side, George Osborne again, I'm afraid, but who... who smashed to pieces. Smashed to pieces that consensus with posters around a, a death, death tax. tax yeah. So often, good policy destroyed by politics. I, I <clears throat> think it's actually... Um, destroyed by bad politics. So I agree with your analysis completely, but, I, but I, I'm of the view that by far the most important thing in terms of governments achieving um, election victories is actual achievements that, that improve people's lives. Um, and people will vote for you if they feel that, they, that they, you're doing that, and they'll vote against you if they feel... Because they're not following the political arguments all that closely, and politicians are overestimating the extent to which they are. So, so to abandon a policy that might work in favour, and I'm not, you know, arguing whether in the, about these particular instances, but to involve, to, to abandon a policy that might work in favour of one that simply makes your argument is, as I think, foolish. I, I do think it matters to have an overall narrative that really does matter, and um, the budget can be valuable if it's part of an overall narrative. And of course, in '92, it, it was, um, and and I agree with you completely about 1970. What Roy Jenkins was trying to do was to put the Labour Party back in on a feeling that it was responsible and it was a government that looked after your money. And I, I therefore think almost certainly that was an election uh, that he improved their chance of winning that election rather than reduce it by the decision that he made. And Jeremy Hunt, if he does decide to try and cut taxes uh, today, it will succeed in so only in so far as either it produces a real and measurable improvement in people's living standards. And I think you've got to look at the figures and think it's likely to be marginal. It, yeah. it might help a bit. Um, and then the other thing is it helps a narrative, um, which is Britain's on the right track. Here is the track. This is all part of it. I still struggle with how they do that without going back to Rishi Sunak's decision to oppose Liz Truss in the leadership election to argue for uh, a more fiscally conservative stance um, and to take her on on the idea that you borrow money in order to fund tax cuts. So I, I don't think they've put that narrative in place. And, so and your, therefore... so your, your point is that it's... The starting point should be the narrative and then you use every opportunity, including a well, budget, to sell it, rather than thinking we're having a budget... What should we do with it? Yeah, yeah. It might it, be look, to put this in Peter's terms and, and in Tony Blair's terms, the, you know, the starting point is decide what you're trying to do for the country. Um, and the budget ought to be a step along that mm. route. But you also give the country an idea what that is. And so and, and I and I think the decision not to reset the narrative after Liz Truss, it, you know, means that it's not obvious to people what it is the Chancellor is trying to do with this budget other than give them a small amount of money. And I, I don't think they'll follow it enough to make that impactful. I, I, the Lib Dems spent most of the coalition years kind of staking a lot of political chips on the idea of raising the personal tax allowance. Uh, and so this is the amount you could earn before you paid any pay tax, tax so at all. people at the bottom. It went up a lot. It's now been frozen, so essentially, in, in real terms, it, it, it's coming down. And actually, of all of the tax cuts you can deliver, it's kind of the fairest because it has the most impact for people on the lowest incomes whereas if you cut rates which is what the conservative would have done and are trying to do now you cut rates it helps richer people more so it's a better tax cut though others would argue that you shouldn't have a tax cut but i remember so many times we were sort of deciding you know where sh where should we push for a kind of a new lib dem policy gain 
uh, in in this particular fiscal event? Should it be this policy? Should it be, let's just push more on the tax allowance, get it up to 10, up to 11,000 pounds. And I think that, to Danny's point, every single time it was a waste, probably because it didn't it didn't match with a story. If it had a benefit for people, it was just maybe they had eight additional pounds a week. And did they assume that that was because of the double Democrats? Well, because thinking, actually, by the time you got to the so 2015 much. election, the Conservatives were boasting that they'd done it. Oh, of course. And they've got a bigger uh, megaphone, so they get, you know, if there is any credit, you weren't even getting it. it exactly. But, you know, that's just, uh, that's old history, really, isn't it? Look, I don't want to blunt this extraordinarily insightful analysis, but I've just got to add a postscript to the 1970 <laughs> general election. In keeping with the title of this uh, podcast, 1970 was the first general election in which I played a part in winning an election. I decided to give up revision for my last two O-levels that I was sitting at the uh, time. They were, by the way, mathematics and religious knowledge. And instead, <laughs> to leave my homework and revision and go and run a committee room in the campaign mm. in Hendon South, to which I devoted myself uh, uh, night uh, and uh, day. And it was that first practical experience I ever got from how to win an election. I mean, the postscript to the postscript, by the way, is that whilst I was prepared to resit religious knowledge and mathematics in the autumn, I actually scraped a pass Peter in Thomas. both. Wow. Peter Thomas got elected, did he not? He did indeed. And um, the, the, I know this partly because I used to, lived in the same area, and um, that 1970 election was the first time I ever went to a polling booth. My mum uh, took me to show me what it was like to vote, and she took me to uh, into these kind of, kind of jelly mould things in Hendon, in Shire Hall Park in Hendon. Right. And I remember going in, and my mum saying to me, this election's about Ted Heath, um, he said it's about Harold Wilson. Everyone thinks he's going to get re-elected, but I don't think he's going to. Yeah. And then the Very, next morning she was yeah, right. Yeah. Good instinct. So there's a parallel universe where you became a bishop or something. I could see you in a... Sorry? With your religious your religious knowledge. Is that, what, is that the world you were...? There were a variety of career routes <laughs> open to me, and uh, I chose, on the, on, the, on the back of my experience running that committee room, I decided it was politics. politics that was my true calling. Not religion. Not religion. There we are. Religion's gain is politics is loss, or is it the other way? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, I think you'd look very nice in one of those pointy hats. I, get, we'll get... Opportunity may come along. <laughs> Enough with the flirting, Matt. Well, we're going to. Well, we're going to talk more. Uh, we've got a question about fashion and politi what politicians wear. Never mind what they're putting in the dishwasher. We'll come on to that in just a moment. We'll do that next. It's Matt Shirley on Times Radio in association with Revolut. You can download the free app. Eighteen plus. Terms and conditions apply. So let's talk more fashion. Uh, we've had this question in from Janie. My grandma voted for Mrs Thatcher because she thought Mrs T had excellent taste in hats and handbags. Is there anything that the current leaders do or wear that would make you want to vote for them or not vote for them? I feel, as our fashion correspondent, we should come to you first, Peter. I think it was really important for Mrs Thatcher. It turned her... This power dressing uh, was an essential part of her uh, Iron Maiden image. But for men in politics, it's much more difficult. No hats, no handbags. All they've got is ties. And in the 1980s, I tried very hard, it was my first sort of Thai challenge, to get Neil Kinnock out of regimental-style stripy ties into something more patterned, something a bit more colourful. I eventually succeeded, got a sort of dark tie with very, very small white polka dots uh, on it. Come into the 1990s, uh, Tony Blair was not the fashion icon that he's since become. He had very, very <laughs> dull ties indeed. And I bought him a shed load of actually rather expensive, quite well made, for which I've never been properly compensated, <laughs> of a very colourful and patterned variety which really showed sort of boldness and confidence. March on, Gordon Brown, complete failure. His favourite tie was a sort of bold, simple, block red uh, tie. He was into brain power rather than tie uh, power. Now in the current, what would I do with Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer? I don't know. My problem with Rishi Sunak's uh, fashion is that he wears these, you know, very fashionable skinny suits and narrow ties. 
And I think they diminish him rather than expand him. And just to be completely sort of even-handed about it, I think that uh, by the same token, Keir Starmer needs to shed a few pounds and that would be an improvement. So, I mean, I don't want to trivialise this podcast any further than I've already <laughs> done. Uh, but but ties are not... Ties and appearance are not unimportant. I remember a story where Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, and it's almost certainly apocryphal, but someone from a Sunday newspaper said they'd been to interview him. And it was, they were supposed to be doing a sort of at home with Gordon Brown type interview, more relaxed, and he'd got a suit and tie on. They said, well, could you maybe go and put something a bit more a bit more casual on? And he went upstairs, and when he came down, he had a different tie on. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it... It, it sounds true. Which it is would true have enough. been a different colour red. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. My dad went in, in the United States, went out to... With, uh, they went on a trip with a, with my uncle and eventually they decided they would change for dinner and when they came, my uncle had changed from his uh, jacket into a tracksuit and my father had changed from his jacket into a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so two completely different means. I agree with the idea that, um, you know, how you look and uh, does, you know, is part of the story. It, it's, it's correlated in a slightly odd way. So I think that to some extent people look at it and they kind of, read into your look the way that you look uh that strong dressing because it's a strong person um rather than rather than the other way around but it's a mixture of things so you want you do want to get those things right and i know i remember when when we were for William Hague, an awful lot of time went into the whole issue of, you know... The baseball, the, the, baseball the, <laughs> Well, it was, you know, it was an interesting... That's a very interesting example, um, actually, of exactly um, what would... About exactly what I mean by narrative. In fact, there was absolutely no... I wasn't there and I wasn't involved in it, so I'm not defending myself on this. There was absolutely nothing wrong. And afterwards, when you asked people about it, they said there was that occasion where William Hague wore his baseball back, cap back to front, which he completely didn't do. Right, um, so it's maybe, maybe people, you should have. In other words, people remembered it because they thought the Tories were pretty useless at that point, and remembered that as being terrible and the stupid things. Where it wasn't, really, well, it wasn't that stupid. Um, so I, my, my, um, and had it been, you know, been worn by somebody who was more politically successful, Tony Blair had worn it. It might have been considered a masterstroke when he was at the top of his game. So I, I. I I think sometimes we read too much into it. But you do, you know, he did later do very well with very well-tailored suits and they were, that was useful. But obviously, you know, we still lost in the landslide, so it didn't help that much. I, I think women do a lot more sort of sending messages with their clothes. And it's not just that question of, you know, that how do you look? Do you look stylish? Do you look attractive? What colour are you using? But also the question of, like, what designers are you picking? Like, who are you endorsing? What You know, Rishi Sunak, I think, does casual quite well, but actually one of the one of the great pictures of him actually is in a sort of cashmere hoodie, which I kind of want, except that I also know that cashmere has a horrible carbon footprint. His wife actually does a whole bunch of investments in uh, fashion businesses. It would be much more interesting, I think, for the Prime Minister to think about... How do you support this extraordinary world-leading fashion industry that the UK has? Like, you know, Michelle Obama supporting up-and-coming mm. uh, American designers, including designers of colour, to promote, again, a story about what you stand for and what you believe in. I think that's part of what's missing. And, and, and it's not fashion, but one of the things I really admired about Keir Starmer was t talking about learning the violin. Uh, you know, it, I'm not going to vote for him because he plays the violin, but... It's something that's clearly authentic to him, a connection to a kind of a, a, a sense of what is important and what's valuable, a connection to, again, something that the UK is brilliant at, which is our creative industries, and a, a sense that he is willing to talk about a part of his humanity that that isn't a sort of engineered to be like, oh, yeah, I really like football, though I think he does, he does authentically like also like football. But like football and the violin, that feels like saying what you actually think yeah. instead of saying what you think people want to hear, which is kind of the vibe we got from Blair about his love of the, football. The violin was another bow to his string. Right? Oh. <laughs> string. What? <laughs> In the run-up to the 19, <laughs> 19, we'll 1997 election, uh, we, went, we went through a phase of folleting our shadow cabinet. I beg your pardon? Folleting. Folleting. Our what? shadow cabinet. And this was named oh, after... Barbara Follett. Barbara Follett, who was a candidate and then later MP for Stevenage, the mm -hmm. wife of the novelist. Ken. Ken Follett. And 
Uh, Barbara developed this sort of theory that the members of the Shadow Cabinet were much more attractive if they were in the right colours. And I remember going to Donald Dewar, the late Donald, the very dour Donald Dewar. <laughs> I said, um, Donald, it's your turn to be sort of folleted next. And he gave me that sort of <laughs> withering look. Robin Cook, on the other hand, loved it. He just was a duck to water. And we had browns and beiges <laughs> and, you know, sort of burnt. Uh, you know, I mean, it was just... A tremendous success. That's what yeah. politics needs, more beige. More, more beige, yeah. more follotic. Don't Google follotic. <laughs> uh, that brings us to the end of How to Win an Election. I was actually joined by Peter Madison, Polly McKenzie and Daniel Finkelstein. How to Win an Election, wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>